If you find this healing sleep meditation sleep story helpful or interesting, feel free to give it a thumbs up, share with someone who may find it useful and leave any comments below. If you don't want to miss any future sleep stories, you can subscribe and click the bell notification icon. My sleep stories are made with you, for you, and posted weekly here on YouTube. You can access all my sleep stories without this YouTube introduction on most streaming and downloads services like Apple Music, Amazon Music and Spotify. If you're interested in what else I offer, you can find details of all this and of my hypnotherapy and autism e-courses, books and merch in the description and on my website danjoneshypnosis.com. So I hope you enjoy this story. So, just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax. I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And while I tell this sleep meditation, I don't know whether you'll drift deeper to the sound of my voice or to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to drift and float comfortably asleep, I'm just going to tell a story where you find yourself walking through a dark wood. And as you walk through this dark wood, the moon is shining overhead, and the silvery light of the moon glistens and shines down through the branches, dancing as the leaves blow in the breeze. And you can see that thick, fog filling the wood, and noticing the way that fog almost seems to part as you walk through it, hearing the sounds of each footstep that you take along that dense mud through the woods. And as you turn off that mud path and head deeper into the woods, so you can hear the occasional cracking of twigs beneath your feet. You can see the way that fog dances between the trees and those shards of light move around almost scanning the woodland below. And you can hear the distant sound of an owl somewhere up in a tree. And in your mind's eye, almost able to pinpoint where that sound is coming from. And you can feel the coolness on your cheeks as you walk deeper and deeper into the woods, as that fog begins to become increasingly dense around you, almost making everything take on a glowing hue sort of glowing grey, where the moonlight is illuminating that fog, as if the fog itself is becoming a light. In whatever direction you look, you can see the shadows of trees, with different greys, as you walk deeper, and deeper into this woodland. And then after a while, you notice this slight tinge of red, and you walk towards that slight hint of red, and you discover a piece of thread tied around 
one of the trees. As if someone has tied some wool to a tree. And you take hold of that wool between your fingers. And you run your fingers along that wool as you follow it. From tree to tree as it weaves from one tree around another. And you can feel the water that's condensed out of that fog onto that wool. You can feel the texture of that wool between your fingertips. And you follow that wool like a red path deeper and deeper into the woodland until you reach a tree where that wool seems to stop. And you run your fingers round the bark of this tree and you look up into the tree and you can just see the shadowy shape of the tree above. You can see that there's an artificial shape up in that tree. You notice that there's a ladder built up the side of the tree. And you reach up, pull yourself up onto the ladder and ascend that ladder. And as you ascend higher up that tree, you start to rise up above the layer of fog everything starts to become clearer you can see that fog almost like glowing silvery liquid hovering beneath the trees you can hear the rustling of the leaves and you ascend up into a tree house up here in this tree, in this wood. And in the tree house, you light a candle. And that gentle candle light dances and illuminates the tree house. And although the tree house is just a basic tree house, with basic wooden sides, it still gives a sense of warmth, as if it perhaps had absorbed some of the warmth of the sun during the day. And it just feels warmer here in this tree house than being down in that fog. And you can notice as you settle down into a chair in this tree house. That your hair is damp from walking around in that fog. And that your clothes are damp. And so you dry your hair. You wrap yourself up warm in some blankets that are in this tree house. And you settle down in that heavily blanketed and cushioned chair, sinking yourself down into that, feeling so comfortable, so relaxed. And after the walk that you've had and climbing into this treehouse, you close your eyes just for a moment. And you begin to drift into a reverie, Drift inside your mind, drifting and floating into the most comfortable daydream. And as you begin to comfortably drift into a daydream, drift into that reverie, you can hear the howl of a distant wolf. 
and you can feel a sense of deep peace and relaxation as you hear the sound of the owl. You hear the rustling of the leaves. And you hear the occasional other sound of birds moving around. Of bats flying and catching insects. And other woodland sounds. Just helping you drift deeper and more comfortable into that reverie. And as you drift deeper, more comfortably into the reverie, you start to create an inner world for yourself. Almost unconsciously, just becoming aware of a different time and place. Finding yourself at the foot of a vast mountain. And it's a mountain range like no other. And it's the most incredible looking mountain range. And as you start to climb the mountain, you notice that the entire mountain is made of dense granite. And you ascend up to the snow line. You continue ascending that mountain. And when you reach the top, you turn and look at how far you've come. You look back down that mountain, you see your route. You see the land beyond the mountain. You see all the way off to the horizon. And in one direction you can see the ocean. In another direction, land just seems to go on and on and on. And you climb all the way to the peak. And you look down the other side of the mountain. And you can notice the difference in the weather. How this vast mountain range stops that weather, reduces the amount of clouds that can pass over the range. And you can see down the other side a gentle slope all the way down towards the ground. And you notice that on that side it appears drier, that instead of forest and lots of greenery, it spreads out like a vast savanna. And you sit down at the peak of this mountain, gazing over that vast savanna. Just catching your breath after the journey that you've made. And as you sit there, you notice the sound of a cat's meow. And you look around, but you don't see anything. And then you hear a few footsteps in the snow. And again you look around and you don't see anything. And then you hear purring coming from right behind you. And when you turn around you see the most incredible sight that up here is a purple little kitten with the cutest little mittens. And they reach up, put their two front paws up against your body, as if to try and climb on you and get a hug. And you find yourself unable to resist 
that purple little kitten. And so you pick it up gently by its sides, and you can feel the warmth of its fur. And you tuck it down just inside your coat, hugging that kitten with its belly facing up. And it nuzzles its head down into your side and begins to purr deeper and deeper. And as you sit with that kitten, you notice that it seems to be drifting peacefully asleep. And so you don't really want to disturb it. And so you sit there for a little while, but at the same time you're thinking that you need to get down this mountain. So you look around you, and you see that there's the bark of an old tree poking out of the snow. And you go over to that bark, carefully trying not to disturb that kitten. And with one hand you pull that bark out of the snow. And you head over to the edge of the mountain. And in your mind you work out that it's a gentle slope all the way down to the bottom. It's a very long slope, but it's a gentle slope all the way to the bottom. And you decide that you're perfectly capable of doing this. And so you place yourself onto that bark. You push yourself closer to the edge with the heels of your feet sliding your bum forward to slide the bark to the edge. And then just as you notice it starting to move and slide on its own, you lift your feet, place them on the bark, and start sliding down the side of that mountain. You can feel the wind in your hair and on your cheeks as you pick up speed and you lean slightly left and slightly right being really careful to control your descent, to keep on track as you descend further and further down this mountain. The sound of that sled passing across and through that snow, weaving slightly to avoid any lumps that you see just in case there's something under the snow that could be unexpected. Making sure that you keep checking on that kitten, peering down, and seeing that it's still resting there, sleeping, almost oblivious to what's going on. And then the sled passes the bottom of the snow line, but continues down the mountain and makes more of a sound like the wood passing across mud and gravel and then grass. And then as you near the base of the mountain, you start to Put your feet down onto the ground, almost doing a rapid run on either side of the sled to slow yourself down, just digging your heels in a little bit. As you come to a halt at the base of the mountain, and you look back up the mountain to the top, see how far you've come. 
and a part of you feels that that was fun and you'd like to try it again. Another part of you thinks that that'd be a lot of effort to climb all the way up that mountain just to come back down again. And you're surprised the kitten slept through one run down the mountain. You doubt the kitten would sleep through climbing up the mountain and coming down again. And you don't know where this kitten's from, how they got up the mountain on their own, why they're wearing mittens. And you've never seen a purple cat before with the softest fur. And as you begin to walk through the savannah, you head towards a hut that you can see in the distance. And as you walk towards that hut, So you can notice a bird of prey circling overhead. You can see different animals grazing. And after a while, that kitten wakes up. And it jumps down out of your arms. And it begins to walk along next to your legs occasionally weaving its way through your legs, rubbing against your legs. Occasionally, it would wander off to explore something and to sniff at bits of grass before coming back and continuing to walk alongside you. And then you see that that kitten seems to have got the scent of something and it goes dashing off, and you just carry on walking. And as you get closer to that kitten, you can see it munching on something, and see it seemingly very excited about what it's eating. And when you arrive at the kitten, and you lean down, it stands on its back legs, it rests on the palms of your hands and you can see its eyes really wide looking at you. And then the kitten starts rolling around and rubbing itself around on the ground before seeming to tire itself out, climbing up onto your shoulder resting across the back of your neck and falling asleep. And while it's resting across the back of your neck, you can hear it purring and hear its tiny, slightly squeaky snores while it sleeps and occasional kicking of its legs as if it's dreaming. And at the hut, you walk around, look in the windows, and it doesn't look like anyone lives there now. And so you open the door, enter that hut. You gently place that kitten down on a cushion on the floor while it continues to relax and sleep. And you take a moment to sit down in the comfortable chair and think about the journey you've been on, climbing one side of a mountain, sledding down the other side of the mountain, and then trekking across this savannah to this hut. And you're unsure where this land is. 
You're curious about this purple kitten. And as the kitten sleeps, so you look out the window towards the animals grazing. And you notice that they resemble cows, but there's something different about them. They look different to the cows you're used to seeing. And you think, if anything, they perhaps resemble highland cattle more than the regular cows that you might see. And while that kitten sleeps, you leave the hut and decide to go and explore, get a closer look. And they're happily grazing, not really paying much attention to you. And you see some of them grazing near the water's edge of a small lake. And then one of them runs and jumps into the water and swims around in the water before exiting the water and almost like a giant dog it shakes itself vigorously to shake that water off and something about the scene of a cow shaking like a dog can be a little confusing, but it's what happens that becomes even more confusing. That as that cow shakes and dries itself off, so its shaking seems to create static, and the cow ends up looking like a giant furball. And you walk over to that cow. And you touch the sides of the cow. And you climb on the back of that furball cow. As it seems to communicate somehow to you to do so. And there's something different about this cow that it doesn't seem to follow the rules like all the others. It seems to think for itself and somehow seems to be able to communicate almost telepathically. And while you're sat on the cow, you feel a deep sense of connection like the two of you are falling into sync with each other. And the cow heads round the lake. And begins to head towards a small rock formation. And on arrival at that rock formation, the cow seems to almost gesture for you to get off and it bows its head, allowing you to dismount comfortably. And you walk over to that rock formation, and you see that in that rock formation is a cave. And as you head into the cave, you shine a torch into the darkness, and notice that somehow writing and symbols seem to appear almost like light on the walls and somehow the light from your torch seems to trigger those light symbols and you try to make sense of those light symbols but you can't quite work them out they look like they could be some kind of language. They don't look like any language that you know or writing style 
that you know. And as you shine your torch around the walls, and the different symbols become illuminated, eventually you're surrounded by glowing symbols that seem to almost be twinkling and sparkling with electricity, remaining illuminated, somehow powered by your light. And you can hear that slight twinkling sound from all of those symbols. And then you see a blue light beginning to form near the back of the cave. And it spirals up from the ground and seems to spiral almost to the ceiling of the cave. And that blue light gets denser and denser, almost as if it's got solid form. And it gets brighter and brighter. And then it begins to fade away. And as it fades away, so you see a dog sat where the light was. And while you watch that dog, and watch that dog watching you, you become aware that that dog seems to somehow understand you and have greater intelligence than at first you may have realized. And then you hear a voice in your mind and realize that dog seems to be communicating telepathically. And it's a deep, comforting voice, a voice telling you to relax, a voice telling you that this dog knows the cat, and that the cat has helped to bring you here, and there's greater intelligence around you than you realise that most people go through life focusing on themselves and focusing on their own standards and then missing things that are different and not realizing certain wonderful things that are out there. And the dog beckons you to get closer And you walk over to the dog. And as you step next to the dog, so that blue light begins to form again. Only this time, you're on the inside of that blue light. And then as that blue light clears, you find yourself on a spaceship and you can see the planet below. And this dog telepathically communicates that their name is Scrappy. And you wonder why they were named Scrappy. But decide not to ask. But because you've wondered, they seem to give a smile, as if to communicate that they know what you're thinking. And you walk over and look out over the planet below. And as you look at the planet below, so you realise that the ship that you're on is spinning and that that spinning is what's allowing you to be able to walk around this ship. 
and as you gaze out the window, you start to form an idea of how large the ship is likely to be, based on the spinning that it's doing, and how large it would need to be to be spinning at that speed, to give you enough gravity to feel like you're walking on Earth. And you wonder what else is in this ship. And whether the ship is a whole ring. Or perhaps two almost counterweighted sections. Or maybe it's just spinning around a certain axis. Almost like a hammer. And you're curious to explore the ship further. But this dog says that they need your help. That you've been led to this place. Specifically because you're somebody who is willing to suspend judgment. And to go with the flow. To explore things with curiosity. And you notice that this dog gets themselves a drink. And they offer you a drink and you accept. And you're curious what drink they're going to pour you. And you find that they go to a machine and a drink just appears. And they hand you that drink. And you're surprised by the way the dog seems to be able to use its paws. That it can look one way at one time. And then from normal paws like any other dog. When it reaches for something, its paws change. And it seems to have elongated fingers and can seem to grasp things. And yet when it's done, it seems to retract back to a normal looking paw. And the dog hands you a drink. And when you taste it, you discover it's your favourite drink. And then you hear that dog's voice in your mind, letting you know that it's telepathic. It knows what your favourite drink is. And then the dog drinks its own drink and lets you know that it's apple cider, that of all the planets it's visited, apple cider is the best drink it's found. And so the dog sits and asks you to sit. And you communicate for a while, while exploring what it is that you need to help them with. And they explain that you need to go to a specific forest. That there's a temple that only a human can enter. And in that temple, there's something you're going to need to get that they can take you to the forest, but you'll have to make the rest of the journey yourself. And they tell you that to be able to do this, you're going to be accessing a temple that's connected through time. And so what you're going to be getting is different to what perhaps you'll expect, but you'll discover that when you get there. And the dog says that we're about to pass over the forest. And you can look out the window and see it down there. 
And as you start looking out the window and you see it down below you, you notice that light. And then as the light clears, you find yourself in that forest. The dog explains that they'll wait here for your return. And they place a beacon that you can follow back to here. And they give you the directions to head. And you start to walk through this forest. And you notice in this forest what the temperature is like, the sounds of the forest. You notice the most beautiful birds flying through the trees, how colourful they are against the green backdrop of the leaves. You can see and hear monkeys jumping from branch to branch. And you have this sense, like all the animals here, are watching and curious about what you're doing. And you head towards the temple. And when you arrive at the temple, you notice it's almost like a stepped pyramid. And you go to the entrance and you see what looks like a well-weathered stone. And you can see on that stone is an impression of a human hand that looks worn, like hands have been touching that space, perhaps for thousands of years. And you place your hand in that handprint. And as you do, you hear stone sliding and scraping as a stone door slides back into the temple and then left out the way. And you walk into this temple and you can hear a slight dripping of water as if somehow over the years water has started to seep slightly through the temple. And you can hear the water drops echoing. And you can hear your footsteps echoing. And you walk deeper and deeper into the temple. And in the middle of the temple, you see a sign. And you notice that it seems to mention that there are 20 steps down this spiral staircase in the middle of this temple. And that as you descend, you go deeper and deeper into the temple. And deeper and deeper inside yourself. You don't really understand what it means. And the sign says, count yourself down the steps. And that'll help you to transition deeper with greater comfort. And so you begin to descend those steps. And with each step, you can hear it echoing, that echo passing down and then bouncing off the floor and back up again. And the echo in the chamber above you. As you step on 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, going deeper, 15, 14, 13, 12, and you begin to feel a sense of heaviness and comfort through your body 
as if descending increases your well-being and your connection with this place. Eleven, ten, nine, eight, going deeper and deeper, seven, six, five, four, three. You take the last few steps carefully to make sure you don't miss any, to make sure you know when you step on the floor in this chamber. Three, two, one. As you step onto the floor of the chamber, and as you do, you notice a glowing in the distance, and you walk towards that glowing, and you see the most beautiful fluorescent lake. And above that fluorescent lake is a blue light spinning and spiralling around. And you put your hand into the water and notice as you do that the water seems to twinkle and make almost the sound of gentle bells as it tickles around your hands and your arms. And you lower your legs into the water. And you feel that that water is the most comfortable temperature. And you notice that it's not even waist deep. And so you walk through that water towards that light. And you see that that light is pulsing. That it spirals around and turns almost into a dense, real object. Before spiralling back around and fading away. And then spiralling around again. And you've already experienced teleporting with a light like that. So you wonder whether this is almost like a permanent teleportation. And you're curious where it goes. But you wonder whether this is a permanent teleportation that keeps turning on, teleporting one way, turning off, turning on, teleporting back, turning off, turning on, teleporting one way, turning off. And you walk into that light. And that light fades around you before building up around you again, almost seeming to be a physical structure around you. And then as it fades again, you find yourself in a room, in a grey building. And you can see in front of you that there are some people and you walk away from the teleporter. And the people introduce themselves. And say that they were waiting for you. That they have something for you. Something you need to take back with you. And you wonder where you are. These are ordinary humans. And they show you out of this grey room, down a grey corridor, into another grey room. And you look out the window. And you can see the moon. And you notice that you're on the moon. And in the distance, in the sky, you can see the earth rising above the horizon of the moon. And just looking out the window seems to almost trick you 
into having a feeling of everything going silent, as if somehow you're aware that outside that window is total silence and peace, and you can see some people driving around on the moon surface, seemingly doing different work. And you carry on walking with these people as they show you to a different part of this room. They show you to a chamber and they open this chamber and they hand you something unusual. They hand you what seems to be a sword with flames surrounding it, but as they handle it, so it doesn't seem to be burning their hands at all, and they tell you that it's perfectly fine. This flame has burned for thousands of years on this sword. This sword was found on the moon, and it needs to be returned to its rightful owner. And this flame is a cold flame, a comfortable flame. And so you take that sword and they explain that you're in the future. And they explain how far in the future you are. And as you walk back towards that teleportation device, you pass different rooms and you just glance in and you see cats and you see rats and you see dogs and you see them all seeming to look at each other meaningfully while working, pressing different buttons doing different jobs, and you realise that they all must be telepathically communicating. And so you find your way back with those humans, as they explain that in their time, which is your future, they're able to interact with various races, various other creatures from across the galaxy, and that that connection has occurred, and they show you back to that room, and they tell you that you'll know who to hand this sword to, and so you beam yourself back down to that temple. And when you appear in that temple, you walk back out of that light. And that light is behind you while you stand in that fluorescent, sparkling lake. And you're holding that flaming sword. And then you notice a hand rising out of the lake. And you reach down and place the sword in the hand that looks like it's trying to grasp at a sword. And you can't see where the rest of the person is because you know that this lake, this underground, fluorescent, glowing lake, isn't even waist deep. And then, following that hand and the arm, the person rises out of that lake and begins to float up into the air. And they seem to give off a glowing light from their body as they hold that sword. 
as if that sword is powering them and giving them additional energy, almost recharging them. And so as they get recharged by that sword and glow more and more, you notice how friendly the face on this person is. And then they start talking, and as they start talking, it's almost like a few voices passing into your mind at once. The most comforting voices you've ever heard in your life. All being heard simultaneously, saying the same thing. As if they're almost singing these words to you. And they explain that they're a specific alien, but they're also an alien that, in the past, humans have regarded as guardian angels, that they connect with one human per lifetime, where they'll watch over that human, and they can go off they can explore the galaxy, that they're beings of light, beings of energy. And these beings of light and energy can travel at the speed of light, where to them there is no time. But when they hear the human in any one lifetime, requiring their assistance. They come back, but many of them had been trapped in these temples and separated from their swords. And that people like you are needed to find the different temples and only humans can access the temples to free them that it was humans that took their swords and trapped them in the temples. And without the swords, gradually, their energy dwindled as more distance from the sword was given. And that this alien is now your guardian angel. They're always going to be there watching over you. And that you'll see them in a glint of light. You'll be aware of their presence with a flash in the sky. With a sudden flash of light in a window. Or an unexpected light glistening in your eye that lets you know that they're always there watching over you. They're always listening. They're always there to be supportive, to help guide you, to help give you confidence and a sense of courage and safety to explore the life you want. A life sharing compassion. And that humans in the future had found the sword. And all the various aliens together, united to try to find out about that sword. And then found the history, found the temples containing writing, But some of these temples have been destroyed by the age of those future humans, with no chance of freeing the aliens, freeing these guardian angels. And so they're using people like you to be able to access these temples in the past. which are in your present, 
to allow you to receive a present in your present and to allow you to connect and have guardian angels back protecting people again and that people often grew up knowing there was something comforting watching over you just over your shoulder something there to support you and help you when you needed it And so this was the first of those guardian angels being freed. And after they've explained all this, they disappear in a flash of light. With their last message being that they're always there, they're still there for you whenever you need them. Whenever you need that additional courage, there'll be that comforting hand on your shoulder that lets you know that you can do it, that helps you remain calm and focused, and you find your way out of this temple. And once out of the temple, you head back through the forest. You head back to that space dog. And the two of you go back to the ship. And back at the ship, they take you back to where you came from. And you find yourself back in that savannah, you head to the cabin. You see the cat still lying there, resting and sleeping. And then the cat stirs and wakes up and comes over to you while you sit down processing the day. And you realise that cat is communicating with you In the most incredible voice, the kindest kitten voice, asking if you've done what you came here to do. And as soon as you say that you have, they say they don't need to be here now. And a blue light appears around them, and as it clears, you see that they've vanished. And you find your way back up that mountain, down the other side. And as you get down the other side of the mountain, you pass some goats climbing and running around on the edge of the steepest part of the mountain, wondering how they seem to be able to do that with such ease and grace when you're being really tentative and careful. And you can hear those goats almost saying hello to you as you pass them by, before finding yourself beginning to awaken in that tree house. And as you awaken in that tree house, you realise that the sun has begun to arise. And that fog has cleared. And you leave the treehouse. You find your way back out of the woods. All the way to the beach beyond the woodland. And when you're on the beach, you stop, take a break for a while. And as you stop and take a break for a while, you can see hundreds and hundreds of baby turtles digging their way out of the sand, scurrying towards the ocean, dwarfed by the size of those waves. 
as you watch them, pushing their way out to sea. And while you watch that, you catch a glint of light in your eye and feel this almost warm touch on your shoulder. And a word, thank you. Just in a whisper, fading away in your mind's eye. Just saying thank you. As you feel that touch lift from your shoulder. And you feel a deep sense of serenity and peace. Just watching nature, just watching those turtles, that blue sea, hearing the sound of the waves on the shore, feeling the warmth of the sun overhead. And you continue to just watch those turtles for a little while longer. And you have yourself a drink while you rest here on the beach, still processing the experience. And then after a while, you continue walking along the seafront. You walk until you can see the boat you've got moored just slightly out into the sea. And you head out to your boat. And you head off on that boat and start making your journey from this place all the way back home. And you go on a long boat journey. And then when you arrive back on shore, you continue your journey home. And once home, having not stopped thinking about the experience and how much of it was real, still curious whether it was just a reverie or whether you really did go and meet a guardian angel. You gaze into a mirror. And as you gaze into that mirror, you begin to see a light form in the mirror. And the guardian angel appears in that mirror and lets you know it was all real. That light, energy, consciousness is all connected. And that you had to reduce your conscious involvement in the experience to allow yourself to travel beyond yourself, to have that experience, to take part in the experience. And now you're all connected and you've got this knowledge. And they're always here for you. And you head to bed. And you settle down in your own bed. And you feel so comfortable. So relaxed. And so glad to be sleeping back in your own bed. And you drift and float peacefully. Asleep. Knowing you'll wake in the morning feeling a deep sense of comfort, of alertness and peace. <laughs>